everyone. I am Debbie Braun, President and CEO of the Aspen Chamber Resort Association. You know, we're going to do a toast in just a minute, so there's some bubbly on your table. I would just ask that you don't touch it quite yet. Um, but wow, what a fast start to the new year. Uh, wonderful skiing conditions, so thank you to the Aspen Skiing Company and everybody who's been out there grooming. Yes, I hope you've gotten out. I'm going to go try out buttermilk tomorrow with my son, but I'm really excited to just get out and enjoy the weather. Um, I think it's so crazy how it was the new year, and now we're kicking off winter school. We're heading into um, Gay Ski Week, and then we're going to top it off in January with the Winter X Games. So that's just in one month. What we do in this community is really just astounding. Um, and you know, I think it's just a really good time to take a quick breather between all that chaos and celebrate community together with all of our friends. So it's wonderful that you're all here. Thank you for joining us um, to celebrate the Helen Calander Rood Winter School Awards Luncheon. And speaking of Helen, the famed woman in black, a public servant, a business advocate, a straight shooter who liked to have fun, you know, this luncheon's in her name so that we remember not only Helen, but we honor her service to our community. She knew working together as public and private stewards of Aspen, that set us apart from our competition, and it really makes for great quality of life. So how about a round of applause for Helen? I also want to thank Aspen Valley Hospital for sponsoring our luncheon today. So thank you, thank you. I thought I'd need your services on Monday when I thought I had the flu, but I did what Dave Ressler tells me to do and just stay home and not utilize the services unless I absolutely have to. So you're welcome. Um, at the end of this month, our board's going to be moving through a transformation uh, with Crystal Logan from the Aspen Institute taking over the chair, of the, um, the chair of the board. Donnie Lee, who's our current chair, moves to our chair emeritus. That's a big fancy name Rick Jones came up with for past chair. Um, and Warren Klug, who is our current chair emeritus, he's actually going to step off the board. Um, both these strong, vocal, lodging and business advocates give really hundreds of hours a year supporting this organization in a leadership capacity. And while it isn't official till the end of the month, I did want to invite them both to the stage. You know I love a good roast. No, I'm joking, come up, come up. Um, please come up to the stage. Um, I want to give you guys what I call sort of a rite of passage in our community. Where's Warren? Oh, I know I put you in the back this year, but come on up. Um, I wanted to give you guys a silver belt buckle, Aspen belt buckle from Jess Hayes. Um, kind of feel like it's a rite of passage for people in our community. Come here. Thank you, you move over here. Warren, over here. No, 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 no. <laughs> is this belt buckle the right size? <laughs> All right, just check it. It's a medium. Is that good? Oh, perfect. Come, yeah, come stand over here for a second. Over on this side. Oh, wow. Over here where that champagne is. Yeah, we're being in, they, some of them follow rules nicely. Um, okay, so um, it's really not official till the end of the month, but thank you guys both so much. Um, Donnie, I suspect you'll still be working with me at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning and for the rest of the year as our chair emeritus, but Warren, I really just want to wish you a wonderful retirement, not only from this organization, but also from the Aspen Square and really this whole community um, on behalf of everyone. Thank you for everything you've done for us, and I'm sure you're going to keep on doing it too. We'll do it. Thank yeah. you very much. Retirement. <laughs> It really does. So why don't you guys grab a glass of champagne right there? I just want to do a taste. Gentlemen, why don't we grab ours? Um, I just wanted to raise our glasses to people like Molly Campbell, Helen Kalanderud, Donnie, Warren, people who have done so much for this organization for so many years. So here's to a great 2019. Cheers. Yes. 
done? Uh, we are done with you boys. However, I would like the opportunity now for the rest of the board to sort of please stand up right now. I'd like to acknowledge all of our board members. I know we have 25 of them. We're taking attendance right now to see how many of the 25 made it. <laughs> Simon, thank you. Patty, great. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Without a strong board of directors, we really can't do, um, we can't fulfill the mission of this organization. And our mission is really to create an environment for Aspen to thrive. So thank you very much. And then it's also important to have a really wonderful staff. Our paid staff is working every day um, to make sure that we are doing best um, for Aspen. So can the staff please stand up too? How about a high five? You get a car, and you get a car, and you get a car. <laughs> um, all right, we have one piece of business this morning um, that we need to take care of, which is, I got to tell you, I love it when the finance chair is just jugging, chugging down that champagne right before I ask him to come up. But Charlie, please come up. Um, per our bylaws, we need to get our 2019 budget approved by our membership. This budget has been looked at by our staff, by our finance committee, by our board of directors, um, and you really you're the last stop in approving our 2019 budget, which there are copies at your tables with detailed notes along with the big one up here, but I am looking for Charlie, right who's right behind me, to <laughs> conduct a little business. Charlie? Okay. Hello, welcome everybody. Uh, Every year we ask the membership to take a look and review and approve the budget. The budget is a zero based, meaning we end the year flat, zero. Uh, it does go through all the steps that uh, Debbie has described and maybe even a couple more. We have a lot of checks, internal checks and balances within ACRA to ensure that uh, money goes where it's supposed to go and that is it. Uh, the notes talk about DM, they talk about uh, how we uh, account for and, and provide those services. So with that, if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to take them now. If not, that was a wave to someone, okay. If not, um, I would like to, your vote of approval. Please say aye if you approve. Aye. Are there any nays? Budget is approved. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Okay, now we're moving into more of the fun stuff. Uh, that was exciting. <laughs> okay, Jennifer Albright Carney, come on up. We are about to crown our king and queen. Good afternoon, everyone, and happy winter school. If I could please ask this year's royal honorees to join me on the stage. Lissa Bollinger and Mike Monroney. <laughs> Have a seat, please. Oh. <laughs> We're very casual here. <laughs> so welcome to Winter School 2019, Aspen Original by Design. The 68th annual Winter School Celebration, Aspen Original by Design, honors the mission of the Bauhaus Centennial Celebration, commemorating the influence of the Bauhaus on Aspen. A big thank you to Alex DeLarb for submitting this year's winning slogan. Winter School, an Aspen Original Winter event, was designed to embrace winter fun and capture the spirit of community. Each year, the Winter School Committee is asked to select Winter School Royal Honorees. This year's two representatives were selected for embracing our community's mountain life and striving to preserve the importance of Aspen's history, sharing the stories of Aspen's past with visitors and locals alike. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2019 Winter School Committee is pleased to honor Lissa Bollinger and Mike Monroney as this year's Winter School honorees. Lissa Bollinger was born in Brooklyn, New York, but her life's journey has taken her to, <laughs> whoop, whoop, to live in many different places. As a child, she lived overseas in Australia and England, as well as back in the United States in New Jersey and Boston, 
where she went to high school. After graduating from high school in 1993, Lissa attended Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Following college, she took a year off to travel with her sister. She's lived in Telluride, Alaska, San Francisco, as well as New York City, where she attended graduate school. In 1994, Lissa's parents bought a house in Aspen, and this is what ultimately brought her to our community. From 1994 to 2002, she would spend her time here on and off. In 2002, Lissa was in Aspen working on her thesis for her master's, which was on the visual arts in Aspen. While she was here, she worked at the Pine Creek Cookhouse and Anderson Ranch Arts Center as a part-time publications coordinator. After receiving her master's in arts administration from Columbia in 2004, Lissa, a self-proclaimed mountain girl, decided to move to Aspen full-time. Of all the places Lissa had traveled and lived, Aspen was the place that truly felt like home. During her time here working on her thesis, Lissa met everyone in the art world in Aspen. This is ex experience is when Lissa was first introduced to Herbert Beyer and his influence on Aspen. She also met David Floria, who grew to become one of Lissa's greatest mentors, and Lissa began working in a gallery in town. Concurrently, Lissa was also supporting her former husband, whom she'd met in high school, with his mountain guide venture. In 2009, Lissa left Aspen to move to Tahoe to run his business. However, as life sometimes takes unexpected turns, Lissa separated from her husband and after only nine months in Tahoe, found herself back in Aspen. Lissa then started to work with her mentor, David Floria, whom she describes as a wise and gentle friend, and at the David Floria Gallery, where she worked from 2009 to 2012 when it closed. It was also in December of 2009 that Lissa received a life-changing phone call. The Pitkin County Housing Authority called to tell her she had won employee housing at Obermeyer Place. She knew then that everything would be okay, and Lissa was able to stay and begin the amazing journey towards her life as it is now. In 2010, Lissa started Walnut 5 Art Advisory, where she works with private clients, art galleries, and also serves as the curator of the Aspen Institute, Institute's art collection and galleries. A fun little fact about the name Walnut 5, Walnut 5 is the original telephone prefix of Aspen with the W and A equating to the numbers two, 9 and 2 on the dial. Lissa selected this little remembered piece of Aspen history for the name of her art advisory because she wanted to root the business in Aspen. Most recently, Lissa has spearheaded the Roaring Forks Valleywide celebration of Bauhaus 100 Aspen, which has brought together more than 25 local arts and culture nonprofits and many individuals and businesses. Under Lissa's leadership, Bauhaus 100 Aspen is on track to have 30 events over the course of the next year. Lissa's passion and enthusiasm have made Bauhaus 100 Aspen a truly community-wide celebration, engaging so many different organizations into the movement, making it personal to each one. In addition to Lissa's work with the arts and culture, she also teaches Pure Bar and has taught a variety of fitness classes, including HIT and Body Pump at various Aspen locations over the years. Lissa loves her work, but also embraces life in the mountains. She can be found backcountry skiing and biking, is involved with a running group, skiing group, a book group, as well as enjoys cooking and spending time with friends. Lissa is so grateful to be a part of this community. She continues to appreciate her Obermeyer Place employee housing win, and now has the joy of having her parents live upstairs and her longtime boyfriend, Andy Dopkins, as her neighbor. Her commitment to community is evident in her endeavors to engage people in Aspen's history through art preservation, conservation, and education. A Colorado native, Mike Monroney, grew up in Arvada, Colorado. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> At the age of 13, Mike received a Christmas present, a ski package from the local recreation program for four Sundays of lift tickets and lessons, and he was hooked. A member of a family of musicians, Mike attended Occidental College, a small liberal arts school in Los Angeles where he majored in theater. After college, Mike stayed in LA and managed a ski department at a sports store, Ashman Sporting Goods. During this time, he skied a lot and obtained his binding certification as a ski tech. However, stage life brought him back to the theater. After performing Summerstock Theater in the summer of 1979, Mike came to Aspen to be a ski bum. 
Prior to landing in Aspen, Mike had tried other ski resorts, including Telluride, Crested Butte, and Steamboat. Having one's binding certification was the ticket to a ski job. However, at every location, the story was the same. We'll give you a job if you have a place to live. He found himself in Aspen because a college friend's parents had a condo here, thus providing the place to live. Mike's first job was in October with the city of Snowmass Village cleaning rocks off of the golf course. He then worked at Aspen Leaf Ski Shop and up at High Alpine Restaurant, which earned him ski bum status skiing 100 days. In 1980, he left to participate in summer stock theater in Cape Cod, then went to Minnesota to go to grad school where he joined the Minnesota Children's Theater. And while he did not end up attending grad school, he did continue on acting. As an actor, Mike moved around quite a bit during a, doing a variety of summer stock and dinner theater, including Paul Bunyan's Playhouse in Minnesota, Boulder's Dinner Theater in Boulder, Colorado, and in the fall of 1982, found himself back in Aspen as part of the freshman class of 82 at the Crystal Palace Theater. But Mike didn't stay here. He went back to Boulder's Dinner Theater for another six years. Then he went to Winter Park's Balcony Theater for a season. Then he went to Vail for three years helped open the TV8 in his first experience being a TV host, then back to Denver, and finally, back in 1992, was invited back to the Crystal Palace for the 35th anniversary of the Crystal Palace. But he couldn't join them. He had a show in Denver, but at the last minute, that show was canceled, and Mike called and said, can I still attend? And they said yes. So Mead enjoyed working with Mike, and in November, he said, I'll see you in November, and finally, 1992, Mike moved back and has been here ever since. <laughs> Mike continued to work at the Crystal Palace until it closed in 2008. Some of you may remember his Winter School lunch and performances from days gone by. As Mike says, you haven't experienced Winter School until you've tried to serve 225 people who all know each other in 25 minutes. The years at the Crystal Palace were both challenging and rewarding. In addition to performing, Mike was also hosting the Aspen Skiing Company's Morning Channel 16 show and found himself burning the candle at both ends, closing the palace at 1 a.m. and then hosting TV at 6 a.m. while still managing to ski a few hours in between. Mike made many connections interviewing fascinating people from Buzz Aldrin to Bo Derek to all the comedians from the Comedy Fest, which was his favorite week of the winter season. In addition, in 1993, Mike began directing his first show for the Aspen Community Theater, which he served on the board of directors from 1994 to 1998. Mike also directed in the summertime at Aspen Theater in the Park in the late 90s, and from 2009 to 2015, directed and performed in the Hudson Reed Theater Company on the Galena Plaza. Mike, too, experienced a life-changing moment when in the fall of 2004, he also won the Employees' Housing Lottery. If he hadn't won, he probably would have left and continued to chase that performing bug. But having a place to live was a weight lifted off of him. And when the Crystal Palace closed in 2008, this stability allowed him to think creatively about staying here. Within a month of the palace closing, Mike had a job at the Aspen Historical Society. Mike was hired to change and juice up the program. They already had an electric vehicle, which was called the History Coach. And Mike became the History Coach a community trainer, the role in which he still serves today. In addition, Mike has fulfilled other roles in the museum, including official videographer, archiving programs for public viewing, creating Silver on Glass, an eight series of film stories created from glass plate negatives, as well as hosts specialized history tours, including his favorite, the pub tour, and in the summer, smuggler jeep tours. In 2009, Mike started writing a 10-minute show to get into the schools called The Great Train Race, a silly, irreverent, theatrical, yet accurate story of the arrival of the railroad to Aspen. This worked so well that it has evolved into a 45-minute play called The Briefly Complete History of Aspen, which is still performed today, not only in schools, but from groups visiting all over the world, as well as taken on the road to various museum conferences. It's a show in a suitcase, and one of the things Mike is most proud of, to have taken something considered an unteachable subject and made it accessible and fun. In 2010, Mike began directing at the Thunder River Theater Company, where he continues to direct, serves as the VP of the board, and is a member of the theater's improv group. And in 2017, the theater's play Constellation, which was directed by Mike, was nominated for the Henry Awards in categories of Outstanding Production of a Play, 
outstanding director, and outstanding lighting. Like Lissa, Mike plays a vital role in relaying the importance of the Bauhaus movement in Aspen. At the Historical Society, Mike was tasked with researching and creating characters of history to perform, one of which was Herbert Beyer. In doing so, Mike discovered a huge part of the history of Aspen that visitors don't often get, and he has since included in the tours he gives. Mike also enjoys traveling during the Crystal Palace off-seasons. He took many bike trips to Europe, cycled the West Coast, visited Asia, China, and Thailand. And in 2004, he received his scuba certification and has traveled the world. He enjoys cycling, fly fishing, and backpacking. And in his spare time, Mike serves as the weekend host of the Weekend Edition on NPR. Original Aspen individuals, as Mike says, Lissa and Mike share a similar absolute enthusiasm for the subject matter they convey and how it relates to the character and history of our town. The 2019 Winter School Committee is so grateful for your passion and energy and keeping the stories of Aspen's past alive. We are truly honored to honor you as this year's royalty. Congratulations, Lissa and Mike. We crown you. I'd like to thank Heather Kemp from Sachet for providing this year's beautiful crowns and scepters. <laughs> so thank you all so much for your support of Winter School. Special thanks to the 2019 Winter School Committee and to the entire staff of the chamber for all their hard work. In particular, I'd like to recognize from the chamber's uh, Winter School team, Brittany Zanine and Noelle Chiarelli. I'd like to thank all the local businesses who have been so generous sponsoring our event, supporting it with donations, and participating in the winter school schedule. Um, we do have an amazing schedule of events planned, so please visit aspenchamber.org. And be sure to join us on Saturday night at Wagner Park. We are hosting AVSC's Rail Jam, as well as a partnership with the fire department for our second annual snow coming bonfire before the fireworks. So we hope to see you all out there. Thank you so much. And now, I'd like to invite Lissa to talk a little bit about Bauhaus 100 Aspen. Thank you. Oh my gosh. That was definitely the scariest thing I've ever been through in my entire life, by the way. Um, talking about Bauhaus, not so much. Who was at the event last night? Yes, like the, this entire room was at the event last night. It was so exciting, holy cow, holy Bauhaus year in Aspen. So um, I was asked to briefly talk about the Bauhaus, which is, as most of you know, really hard for me to talk briefly about it. But um, just so that you all know what we're talking about, unless you were at the event last night, Crystal gave a great introduction. The Bauhaus was an art school that was founded in 1919 in Weimar, Germany. It existed for 14 short years, only from 1919 until 1933. The fact that we are sitting here talking about the Bauhaus in Aspen is just a very unusual event. Um, I guess the question I get asked most frequently is, who cares? Who cares about the Bauhaus? Why does Aspen care about the Bauhaus? The Bauhaus was a radical art school that integrated all of the arts into one school. Um, it was a school that rethought the way that art would be considered in education and in life, so that art was integrated in all aspects of life, including this microphone. All aspects of life were considered to be part of design and art. The reason why we care about this in Aspen is because in 1946, Herbert Beyer moved here, and Herbert Beyer was a master of the Bauhaus of typography and design. It is a completely serendipitous event. He was invited here by Walter and Elizabeth Pepke. He moved here, and he allowed for this Bauhaus influence to come to Aspen. It's really serendipitous. It's one of the things that makes our town so unique and so special, and personally gives me so much pride in our town, makes it one of the most amazing places. We, all of us in this room, I know, are so happy to live here. So that is the reason why we're celebrating the Bauhaus centennial celebration. I hope that I see all of you at every single event throughout this year, no pressure, especially the Bauhaus Ball on June 6th at the Wheeler. Um, one more thing, because I always forget to say this, check out our website, www.bauhaus100aspen.org for all of the amazing events. Thank you. Thank you for this amazing honor, too.
We are going to get started with the rest of our program today. Um, I would like to start by asking Donnie Lee, who's the general manager of the Gantt, to come up to give us or to award the Molly Campbell Service Award. And Molly was the GM of the Gantt, and she taught Donnie everything he knew. And now Donnie's taught me everything I know. Um, so the cycle continues. So come on up, Donnie. For more than four decades, Molly Campbell was the epicenter of Aspen's lodging community. She lived a life of high values and integrity, inspiring those around her to do the same. She committed herself to championing excellence and improving our community through her volunteer efforts. Professionally, Molly advanced from being the lone receptionist at the Gantt to serving as the property's general manager for 32 years. Molly spent 26 years on the board of Stay Aspen Snowmass and twice served as a chairperson of the Aspen Chamber Resort Association. While working as a chairperson of ACRA, Molly was instrumental in passing the first lodging tax that contributed about 500,000 towards the destination marketing effort on behalf of the Aspen community. Molly's untimely passing in 2007 was a major loss to the town of Aspen but her vivacious spirit and commitment to community service lives on through the award named in her honor. The Molly Campbell Service Award is presented annually to an Aspen resident that personifies Molly's get-it-done personality, her ability to enjoy life, and her enduring contributions to the community through service and volunteerism. Her drive really was about trying to help people be the best version of themselves. And that really carried through into Aspen. She wanted Aspen to be the best version of itself. And she thought Aspen was its best when people were involved. She led by example. And leading by example was stepping out of her professional role at the Gantt and doing outreach for all various kinds of initiatives to keep the city vibrant and, and functioning on all cylinders. Molly nurtured volunteerism, collaboration, cooperation within all everything she did. Molly Campbell had so many accomplishments, but to me the one that stands out was working within the lodging community and integrating it into the huger community. And she was willing to go out on a limb to do that. It was her spirit that would inspire you, it would make you laugh, and it would encourage you to get involved, to care about your community. Molly's legacy of service and leadership is passed on every year when the Molly Campbell Service Award is given. A candidate for the Molly Campbell Award embodies her spirit, her love for community, her desire that Aspen become a premier resort. This award means, means a lot for me personally and I think for the past recipients. And it's one of those awards that, that brings in um, acknowledgement to what people are doing sometimes behind the scenes. Or it's not something that's uh, necessarily on the front page of the paper. But they're working to continue uh, the community feeling that we have here in Aspen. And the winner is All right. Thanks for all being here today. What a full house, and welcome to Winter School and the winter, and we're going to enjoy it. Uh, what better way to celebrate uh, Molly's? Huh? Oh, nice. What better way to celebrate Molly's <laughs> spirit and uh, keep alive and recognizing uh, those that share those principles and contribute? to our great community through their uh, own sustained volunteer efforts. And now that you know who that is, <coughs> um, this year's recipient is, is uh, no, uh, no exception. Um, having moved to Aspen in 1987 and joining the Volunteer Fire Department in 89, um, his big heart has been on display um, ever since. Um, whether it was responding to local issues or maybe borrowing a truck to go and, and help in a national crisis, he would, he would do that as well. His continuation of trying to make sure that the community celebrated um, Fourth of July, Halloween, 
starting the honor guard um, so that uh, memorial services and other events um, had that community participation and celebration uh, has been key and we're all better off for it. Um, and so his passion uh, and leadership of uh, the volunteer fire department has, has been something that we're all grateful for. Uh, obviously I can cut to the end here. So um, <laughs> join me in congratulating Rick Ballantyne, this year's recipient is Molly Campbell, service award winner. <laughs> because we don't think they pay you enough. <laughs> wow. Um, n I guess now I know why I was voluntold to be here by my wife. <laughs> I, I, I'm really pretty blown away. I had no idea, honestly, that why I was coming here today, except to come be with a lot of my friends like Tony and everybody else around here. So I'm um, really, really am honored, especially because I knew Molly and she was a wonderful woman. And Anything with her name on it, that has my name on it next to it, will be forever indebted to, to, to the p people that chose me to do this. But <sighs> I'm really kind of blown away. But I just want to say, you know, looking around this room here, I I'm so honored and so grateful to do what I do for this community and to help do what I do to help um, keep our community safe. But it's not me, I can tell you. It's, I've got a very, very strong staff of volunteers and career staff and my board that supports me and uh, it's that's why I do what I do you know we had a discussion the other day about something that happened in town uh, recently and I was feeling a little down the other day and I said you know maybe maybe it's time for someone else to take over the reins but then we had an event happen that we were able our fire department was actually able to save someone's life and I said okay I'll stick around for a while longer <laughs> Because that's a kick in the pants, and I, I'm so honored. Um, thank you all very much. Thanks. Thank you. This too? Yeah. Oh, yes. You take the box. Uh, what Donnie failed to mention is that uh, this award comes with an honorarium of $1,000. So here you go. Do good. Continue to do good. Thank you. Yeah. My dad was a fire chief in Alaska for 35 years, so um, what a great choice, um, and what a great fire department. So congratulations, Rick. Thank you. I left my glasses at the table. I'll be right back. old isn't that much fun. Um, okay, here we go. Our next award I'm very excited about. I actually get to pick the Defy Ordinary winner. So if you ever want to be a Defy Ordinary winner, I am taking all submissions throughout the year. So this year's winner is Dynamite. I'm really excited to talk about this retail owner in Aspen. And in fact, he's owned his store in Aspen since 1993. He says when you've been around for 25 years, you've traveled a lot of back roads and made thousands of mistakes, you too can become great at whatever you do. He doesn't seem to, sm sm uh, he doesn't seem to sweat the small stuff. He's a master at making the customer, customer feel important. He conducts business the cowboy way, and I'd like to think the cowgirl way, too. It's integrity, determination, and plain old common sense. In fact, this year he dropped off to my office what I deem the local retail manifesto, defining small business success, detailing a passive approach to retail versus active foundations. His foundations consist of over-the-top, customer service combined with a passion for the American West. 
building relationships, and showing respect. This cowboy is really the first to send me an email throughout the year when things are going well, not just to lodge a complaint. He shares his ideas and is committed to providing exceptional customer service. If you guys aren't following his store on social media, you need to get on Instagram right away um, because it's good old fashioned fun. This year's Defy Ordinary winner is Tom Yoder. Can I get a yee-haw? <laughs> Come on up, Tom. You defy ordinary. Thank you, Thank you so much for all you do. Thank Here's you a pretty much. little award. And please say a word. Come on. You can. Go. You can. I mean, check out that Instagram feed with all those great people. Well, <clears throat> thank you. I had no idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, we sure have a heck of a lot of fun at Chemo Salve, I'll tell you that. And um, we've got a staff that we try to do two things, and one is passion about everything we do, and the other is what we call small victories. And small victories may be as simple as um, making sure we have the cleanest sidewalk in town or our staff will run outside and, and see people trying to fool around with the parking meter and what am I, how am I gonna buy a ticket? And, um, the most fun thing that we like to do is when you see a group of uh, six ladies from Indianapolis <laughs> and they're all gathered around a map and you go, um, can we help you find some? Oh, no, 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 no. But you know what they're looking for is the pot store. So you could say, <laughs> So you walk them over there and go, here's what you're looking for, ladies. <laughs> but um, thank you very much. Aspen is, we love it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Our 2018 Nonprofit of the Year winner is Defying Ordinary and setting an example for excellence in Aspen and beyond since 2013. While a lot of us talk about solutions to clean air and alter, um, alternate options to driving a car, six years ago, a husband and wife team chose to be part of the solution. What started as a small plan to offer alternate transportation to Aspen residents at a small fee has now grown to connecting residents of Basalt and El Jebel, offering free rides to all users provide raft bus stations with additional accessibility, and actively working to engage our Spanish-speaking community. Most impressive is their national leadership. The Transit app was among the first of its kind to offer checkout services on the same platform as real-time bus schedules. And 70% of our community uses this nonprofit's service, the highest percentage of any city in the nation. While growing 529% since its inception in 2013, they've managed to keep operating costs down and continually make progress towards their and our community goals. Finally, their team culture rolls right back to their vision. In order for a wheel to roll, it does not function on a hierarchy or s and silo, but rather on synergistic relationships between the hub and its spokes. Together, they must be aligned, functional, and cohesive, as is the case with their team. They have shown us what can be achieved when a good idea is backed up with hard work and determination to succeed. Please join me in congratulating WeCycle as, the award, as we award them the 2018 Nonprofit of the Year. I'm the Fiji water girl. Um, 
I'm Mirta Mallory with WeCycle, and I'm so honored and um, touched to receive this award on behalf of WeCycle with Kellen Wardell, our program manager, and Rebecca Cole, our board chair. But really, we accept this award on behalf of the community. For WeCycle would not be what it is today without our partners, many of whom are here today, without our sponsors, without our remarkable team members, and fundamentally, our riders. Back in 2013, we defied ordinary and were the first resort community to implement bike share in North America. There were less than 30 bike shares in the North America at that time. T today, <laughs> we defied ordinary again this past year in partnership with the city of Aspen, town of Basalt, and Eagle County as we brought the first fare-free bike share system to North America. With that, bike share rides were offered to everyone with, who chose to download the app and ride WeCycle for less than 30 minutes at a time and remain a transit service and charging you 50 cents per minute if you kept the bike for longer than 30 minutes to differentiate between bike rentals. This fare-free service aligned with Aspen's other fare-free services and has, was a tremendous success with ridership soaring into the 60,000 rides and a 45% growth this year alone. But this ridership would not be possible if it weren't for the community, again. Our founding partners believed in alternative transportation and pedal-powered mobility for our community and started to think big of what we could implement together. We'd like to thank Aspen Snowmass Sotheby's, who for six years has been our title sponsor and helped promote our vision of a community that gets around by bicycle. And to our over 50 sponsors, who not only sponsor bicycles and stations, but encourage employees and their staff and their guests to ride a bike and experience Aspen in a unique, uh, original, and not ordinary way. And lastly, or fundamentally, this program would not work if it weren't for an extraordinary team who you see riding bikes around all the time, Aligned with our mission of reducing carbon emissions and traffic, our bikes are balanced. 70% 70 70 of our bikes in the Aspen system are moved around by bike. Those peddlers who you see out are bike balancers ride between 30 and 55 miles per day. So give them a high five when you see them. They keep this system rolling. And they make the system possible for all of us, our riders who are aligned with our community values by getting on a bike to reduce traffic, to make a difference for the environment because it aligns with their values and our community values and to live a healthy, vibrant lifestyle and getting a little bit of exercise when they need to get somewhere quickly. Bike share, we often think, well, my, my pedal, what, what, what I do every day doesn't make a difference. And yet, every pedal stroke does make a difference. If you choose to get on a bicycle, you're making a difference in reducing our traffic and our congestion. Our riders tell us per their survey that 47% of their rides replace car trips. So every bike ride makes a meaningful difference. And in doing so, we're connecting a community with multimodal transit as we see our riders connect with Rafta coming up and down the valley. Fundam as, you've just, as Debbie mentioned, bike equity is a fundamental core value of WeCycle. We were one of nine, re nine recipients of the Better Bike Share Partnership, which was a program founded nationwide to help make bike share equitable within communities and set the standards moving forward. And I think what we're most proud of with this program as we serve the Latino community is that our Latino riders are riding in both the basalt and system Aspens, demonstrating the connectivity of a regional transit system and how the first and last mile are critically important. And that brings me to our values as a community is that we are one community, we are one region. And bike share can help us at the first mile as well as, as, well as at the last mile. And thanks to the successful passage of the RAFTA 7A measure this past fall, WeCycle is going to be coming to Carbondale and Glenwood Springs in the years to come so that we, as we all know, our traffic and our tra challenges of transportation don't just begin here in Aspen, but are regional. And if we can get on a bike in Carbondale or Glenwood and then on a bus, we are magnifying the impact of our environmental, our, our carbon emissions reductions, and we are taking cars off the road. So please join me in continuing to hop on a bike, download the app, get WeCycle in your pocket, and hop on a bike and be part of transforming our community one pedal stroke at a time. Thank you. Can I just say, how do you even have energy giving birth two days ago? <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs>
I think she might be taking a nap now. Thank you, Myrta. <laughs> This was important. She needed to be here. <laughs> OK, this year was a tough one for business of the year. With plenty of applicants, our committee really had to make a decision between excellent and brilliant. Our winner, though, pulled ahead through their commitment to both community and to our visitor, successfully finding a balance between resort and community. A staple in downtown Aspen since 1950, this business has changed hands a few times, but continues to remain a local brand that embodies the mind, body, spirit of Aspen, and now carries that message beyond our city limits. This organization not only commits countless dollars to local nonprofits, but also supports them with event space and even provides emergency shelters on a regular basis to nonprofits like Response and this past summer to our late Christine firefighters. They also internally reduce their environmental impact through coordinated boiler systems and climate control heating, almost zero disposable plastic use, and low capacity water systems. This also rings true to the Aspen Chamber's goal of sustainable and responsible tourism, as their efforts directly lower our guests' environmental impact. Finally, their customer service runs top down all employees, including those executives, offer service with a smile. As one young guest saw snow for the first time and was convinced that Princess Elsa from Frozen brought it for her, a front desk concierge brought an Elsa costume and posed as the princess, creating a lasting memory for both the young child and her parents and helping them create that emotional connection to Aspen that we're all thriving for or striving for. They are defying ordinary. We're so thankful for this business's commitment to Aspen, and we can't wait to see how their property carries our community ideals and brand. Congratulations, Limelight Hotel. Henning, come on up. You are the 2019 <laughs> Business of the Year. Oh, there you are. And my neighbor. Click and talk at the same and time. I don't know how to. <laughs> There's not really a slide for him. Right here. Beautiful building. Um, I only say Amazon Prime. That's how you pass to get a costume here to you know, present it to a little girl. And um, it it was magnificent to see really the the eyes lit up from this little girl when she saw. Elsa is here, and uh, <laughs> I wish we had a slideshow about this because it's really my team took it up to the next level. Really, our concierge went on Amazon Prime a minute after she found out what this little girl experienced, um, went ahead, purchased this dress. One of our other front desk agents dressing up as Elsa and taking hours walking around Aspen town, a town downtown, and then playing with her, and it's, it just took it to the next level. Um, for those who don't me, I'm Henning Raman, the general manager here at the Langner Hotel in Aspen. Uh, we have two now, I have to mention it, as the Aspen property. Um, I don't want you to go ahead and congratulate Lindsay, who just opened successfully a hotel. <laughs> and it's like, great job, and you won this business. <laughs> Anyhow, it's just me. But um, it is a distinct honor, really, to stand up here and um, as everyone else who stood up here. I couldn't have done it without you, you my team over here. Nine representatives uh, today, but really there are 70 more at the hotel, and they really have come together and made the Limelight Hotel what it is today. So thank you very much. Um, you know, additionally, I would like to thank really our ownership and our current leadership of the Aspen Skiing Company to allow us what we do on a daily basis, to commit to local organizations, to host fundraisers. Uh, Bauhaus yesterday, I had to shut the doors yesterday. I had to kick people out. It's like, <laughs> got a threatened phone call this morning. It's like, wow. <laughs> um, it was really wonderful to see how uh, this community takes off and, and, and really shares uh, their love with us. 
Uh, we are now known as a community living room. Uh, we see it on a daily basis and it's really um, showing at our new property in Limelight Snowmelt as well. I mean, I can't thank you enough, all of you who are sitting here. Um, it is a distinct honor to receive this reward today and um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Oh, no, that's okay. I think it's all right. Thank you all for joining us. Have a wonderful winter school. Go out, hug somebody, celebrate, um, and let's just have a great 2019.